Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, some amazing Jurassic fossils have revealed how our middle ear evolved, a new plesiosaur from Antarctica has been discovered, evidence to challenge Bergman's rule has been found, and much, much more. Starting off the news this week, researchers working with the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument have continued work on the biggest 3D map of the universe created to date, as they seek to answer some of the most pressing questions of our universe those surrounding dark energy. It is currently believed that dark energy makes up over two thirds of our universe, but almost nothing is known about it other than its role in causing our universe to not only continue to expand, but expand at an accelerating rate. Dark energy was only first theorised as we started to map out the larger aspects of our universe and started making observations that didn't make sense with our understanding of how everything worked. The team at DESI hopes that, by mapping out the universe like never before, we can understand more about dark energy and its role in shaping the universe. The initial data from this massive map actually suggests that dark energy might also change over time despite the initial assumption that its density was constant. While the team doesn't have enough proof that this is certainly the case, the assumption was questioned when comparing the data with studies of supernovas, instead of just comparing it against the current accepted model of the universe. While there is definitely something here worth looking into, it's not quite considered a major discovery yet. But if it were to be confirmed, it would drastically change what we know about how the universe has evolved over the last 13.7 billion years. In other news, a study published in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage has analysed the ancient Egyptian belief that the Milky Way that they saw in the sky was a goddess called Nut. A researcher from the University of Portsmouth sought to shed new light on the question of what the Milky Way physically represents for ancient Egyptian culture, and the idea that it could have been a physicalisation of the goddess Nut is not a new one, but one that the researcher wanted to further analyse. Astronomical analysis was done on what the night sky would have looked like at the time of the ancient Egyptians, and this was looked at in conjunction with ancient texts to determine whether or not the parts of the sky that were clearly important and representative of the goddess were indeed the Milky Way. One of the main primary sources used for this study was an ancient text more commonly referred to in the modern day as the Book of Newt, due to an earlier histographical mistake, but actually named the Fundamentals of the Course of the Stars. The text is a collection of ancient Egyptian works on astronomy, rather than a single codified work. But as you can guess from the modern title and her role as the sky goddess, Newt plays an important role. This alone naturally gives Newt a strong connection to the stars, but the study found that it wasn't quite as simple as discerning whether or not Newt's form was simply the Milky Way. In addition to fundamentals, other sources were used, like a collection of texts called the Pyramid Texts, and another collection called the Coffin Texts. Interestingly, the Coffin Texts are spells and other formulas of magic written on ancient coffins. The study found that descriptions in fundamentals of Newt's place in the sky do largely line up with the Milky Way in the ancient Egyptian stars. However, not her entire body is represented by the Milky Way, and that different parts of the sky goddess are revealed in the night sky, some of which are not seen in the Milky Way throughout the year and as the Earth changes its orientation, so a different night sky is seen. Through its cultural analysis, the study found links between Newt's role in the afterlife and the autumn bird migration to other similar roles that the Milky Way has for other cultures around the globe. Different mythologies from different cultures often have lots of crossover, most famously that of the ancient Greek and Roman gods, so seeing similarities between cultures is nothing new. Understanding how this links to the Milky Way in the sky, however, is important and does highlight a link between the Milky Way and Newt. Interestingly, the study also found connections between Newt and even contemporary conceptions of the Milky Way in the night sky. The study does point at the end of its analysis that we should be careful to directly link these correlations back to Newt. Rather, again, understand how the Milky Way has been seen in a similar light across time and culture. A fascinating study that links history and astronomy and helps us further understand what our ancestors thought when they looked up at the night sky and saw our galaxy in all its majesty.
Also in the news this week, a report has been released detailing how much tropical forest loss the world suffered in 2023. Analysing satellite data, the report found that there was, fortunately, a 9% reduction in the loss of primary tropical forest in 2023 compared to 2022, largely due to political shifts in Brazil and Colombia. However, the decrease was also counteracted by a concerning increase in forest loss in other countries. Looking globally, the loss of tree cover from natural and human causes in both forests and plantations went up by 24% in 2023 compared to 2022, which was found to be almost entirely due to a five-fold increase in tree cover loss from fires in Canada. If the world is to meet the agreed upon target of ending deforestation by 2030, then a minimum of 10% yearly reduction in deforestation is needed, which so far is not being met. However, hopefully the reduction seen in Brazil and Colombia will show that it is possible to cut rates of deforestation and to preserve these crucial habitats that harbour so much biodiversity and act as a major carbon sink. Last week we promised an update about the orca calf whose pregnant mother died after becoming beached in what looked like a failed attempt at hunting a harbour seal. We are pleased to report that the calf is doing well. There have been attempts to provide the calf, called Brave Little Hunter, with food but it is unclear as to whether she has eaten any of it. However, it looks as though she has been hunting birds, so she does seem to be able to feed herself. And at the moment, she shows no signs of being emaciated. The calf's skin is starting to slough off in large patches along the top of the head and base of the dorsal fin on each side, which is possibly due to the freshwater runoff into the lagoon. Her health is being closely monitored both visually and acoustically by many experts, including vets and drone operators. She has been observed to make deep dives which regularly exceed aerobic dive limits. She also calls in bouts every 10 to 15 minutes or so. It is believed she is calling for her family, but due to the isolated location of the lagoon, they can't hear her, which is just heartbreaking. Initially, there was a plan to move the calf by helicopter, but it was thought that this could be too stressful for her. The plan now is to lure her using sane nets into an area where she can be placed into a sling, where she can then be moved onto a truck and then drive to an area outside of the lagoon and then placed onto a boat. She will then be placed into a net pen, which was used for salmon farming, where she will remain until her family passes by. It is hoped that this plan will be implemented in the next week. To cause the least amount of stress for the young dolphin, the plan needs to go like clockwork and cannot last more than a few hours. Recently, her family, which includes her grandmother, was spotted swimming near Vancouver Island. It is imperative that she is reunited with them. At two years of age, she is still too young to look after herself and needs the support of her family. Our thoughts are with Brave Little Hunter and all the amazing people who are doing all they can to help her. Hopefully, the news next week will be that she has been successfully removed from the lagoon into the CPEM. We wish them all the very best of luck. First up in the paleontology news this week is the publication of a very interesting paper reporting on new fossils that reveal how the mammalian middle ear evolved. It's long been understood that the bones positioned at the back of the lower jaws in the ancestors of mammals, called the articula and the quadrate, along with the other bones behind the dentary, were the precursors to the middle ear of true mammals, with the articula becoming the malleus, or the hammer, and the quadrate becoming the incus or anvil. These bones still form part of the jaw joint in reptiles and birds, whereas modern mammals just have the dentary. Well, some early mammalia forms, such as the Triassic to Jurassic age Morganucodon, have a sort of dual jaw joint representing the transition from these bones being part of the lower jaw to becoming the middle ear. However, many details about the specifics of this transition have long been mysterious, owing to the poor fossil record of mammalia forms from this period of time. This new study, published in Nature, reports two new Jurassic mammalia forms that shed much new light on this development. A Morganucodonton-like species called Dianacodonton Dianaconodon, called Dianaconodon youngi, and another kind of mammalia form called Ferrodocodon chawi. Yes. Both species preserve middle ear bones, and the early Jurassic aged Dianaconodon 
Oh, I said it wrong. And the early Jurassic Age Dianaconodon shows some previously unknown bone morphologies that indicate the articular and quadrate bones had lost their load-bearing functions by this stage. The geologically younger Pharadocodon, meanwhile, still has articulars and quadrates attached to the back of the lower jaws, but more closely approaches the mammalian condition as the bones seem to have been used for exclusively auditory function. So these fossils provide a very important look at how our hearing system evolved and how the gradual loss of a function in load bearing in these bones enabled them to eventually become detached from the lower jaw. Also in the news this last week we welcome a new species of plesiosaur. It's a new kind of elasmosaurid that comes from the very end of the Cretaceous period and was discovered in rocks on Seymour Island in Antarctica. Named Morambionectes molinari, it's known from a partial skeleton, including bones from the base of the skull, the lower jaws, teeth, 48 vertebrae from the neck, more vertebrae from the back and tail, plus ribs, bits of the forelimbs and hindlimbs, and even some gastroliths, stones that the plesiosaur swallowed and which became polished in its stomach. It's been found to be a relative of a couple of other plesiosaurs that also lived at the very end of the Cretaceous and have been found in Antarctica, being a member of the Wedelinectia. So a very exciting addition to our record of these wonderful long-necked reptiles. Next up, we have another very interesting study published this last week, which has challenged Bergman's rule. This is a rule that predicts that homeothermic animals, such as birds and mammals that inhabit cooler climates closer to the poles, will in general have larger body sizes than those inhabiting warmer climates, as a large body size will help them to retain heat more easily. However, the reality of Bergman's rule has long been questioned by scientists as it doesn't always seem to apply. Generally though, studies on this rule have focused on modern ecosystems and animals, but this new research has now used data from the fossil record of dinosaurs and mammals to test it. Looking at examples of these animals from the Mesozoic, when the temperature gradients of the planet were less extreme than they are today, they find no evidence for Bergman's rule operating in these groups. And so the evolution of body size was not associated with dispersal to cooler climates. Additionally, when applying their model to living mammals and dinosaurs, the birds, they found that body size evolution was again independent of latitude. However, a modest temperature influence was discovered in living birds, but not in their Mesozoic ancestors, potentially suggesting that the more recent Cenozoic climate change influenced their body size evolution and that Bergman's rule did apply to some extent. It just wasn't always influencing them. So a very interesting paper showing how deep time data can be used to test such ecological principles. And finally for the news this week, a study has been published that has examined the growth rates of dinosaurs and the other animals that lived alongside them at the very beginning of their evolution, during the Triassic period. Looking specifically at the Ischigualasto formation of Argentina, which dates to around 230 million years ago, the paleontologists sampled thin sections of bones from these early dinosaurs, as well as the crocodile line archosaurian reptiles that they shared this environment with, to see when the elevated growth rates that set later dinosaurs apart from other reptiles and mammals of the Mesozoic first evolved. What they discovered is that the vertebrae animals of Ischigualasto all had relatively high growth rates. And while dinosaurs were among the fastest growers, some of the crocline archosaurs were also growing pretty quickly. These early dinosaurs also grew at least as quickly, but more continuously, than some later sauropods and theropods. So it seems that an elevated growth rate was ancestral to dinosaurs, and although it likely played a significant part in the later global dominance of dinosaurs, rather than other groups of reptiles, in the early part of their evolutionary history, this feature was actually shared with various other Triassic groups, meaning it's not what initially set them apart. Another fascinating study. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and we'll see you next time.